Welcome to the show and a special edition on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the birth of Harold Washington, Chicago's first black mayor. We've assembled a stellar panel of people who worked in the Washington campaigns in his administration and those who covered and chronicled him. And this is not just a panel, it's a reunion. And I wanna introduce our old friends, starting with Jackie Grimshaw, who was an advisor and strategist for Harold Washington's 1983 mayoral campaign. She later led the mayor's office of intergovernmental affairs and now serves as a vice president for governmental affairs at the Center for Neighborhood Technology. Luis Gutierrez is the former U.S. Representative for Illinois, representing the 4th Congressional District. Representative Gutierrez worked on Washington's campaign and later was a key city council ally who helped the mayor win his majority after years of council wars. Peter Nolan is a former NBC5 Chicago political reporter. His book, Campaign, The Election That Rocked Chicago, has just been reissued on the, on the note of the 100th anniversary of Harold Washington's birth. And Gary Rivlin, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author of Friar on the Prairie, which chronicled the Washington years. His new book, Saving Main Street, Small Business in the Time of COVID, will be out this fall. I covered Washington's 1983 campaign and, and the first half of his administration. And then later I went to serve as deputy press secretary. And Lynn Sweet, our at the table co-host and Washington bureau chief for the Chicago Sun-Times, also covered the mayor back in the day. Lynn, can you kick us off by setting the stage for the 1983 primary and the candidates? Okay, and thank you. And it's great to be here and to see everybody. As you may see in the background, I, I brought downstairs to my uh, home studio here, a Harold Washington banner that was part of the cityscape back in the day. Uh, so let me set the stage, as Laura said, in 1983, Mayor Byrne was the mayor. She lost her popularity. She lost the support of much of the black community. By then, there was an election coming up. And months before that, in 1982, members of the black and brown and liberal community were kind of looking around for a candidate. So Harold Washington, to compress this, was asked to run and he said, well, if you find a bunch of people to register, maybe I will. And that hatch come alive. Remember all that? That was one of the big slogans. It was, uh, we shall see in 83 and come alive. So now we're in uh, 1983, he runs. Harold Washington was seen as the long shot member of Congress, he had legal problems, law license suspended, didn't pay taxes. Uh, so he'd run for mayor. Rich Daly, the state's attorney, was running, and he it, the race was seen as a matchup mainly between Mayor Byrne and Rich Daly. Now, before I go further, everyone's wondering, since we are talking about the election of Chicago's first Black mayor, was race a factor? And I'll put that on the table. Race was always a factor. But during a lot of the campaign and the primary, it didn't come up until the very last days when two reporters were at a church in Portage Park and they heard Ed Vidoliak talk about the race and he said, and I'm synthesizing what he said, he said, it's a racial thing. That got out, the uh, campaign was able to make a commercial and in the end, primary campaign, which was marked by a very exuberant time in the city, in a sense, uh, we could talk about that with buttons and everything else. So in the end, uh, Washington won 36.7% uh, with Byrne coming in third and Rich Daly last. Now, when we go to the general campaign, back in that day, this was a, just a partisan race. We don't have it now. The Republican was Bernard Epton, a state representative from Hyde Park, seen as a liberal, but the race got ugly because his slogan was, vote for Bernie Epton before it's too late. Eventually, Mayor Washington won the Bernie Epton uh, battle, 51.9. Starting what we'll now discuss, Laura and everyone else, the first years of this very historic uh, mayoralty, and I hope we could discuss the very um, historic nature too of the campaign. Thanks for relaying that out, Lynn. And I guess I would like, I'd love to go to Jackie Grimshaw since Jackie, you were there at the beginning 
uh, actually way before the beginning. And uh, I'd love, love to just touch on, go back to the whole issue of race that Lynn raised and, and the role that race played. Now, a lot of people, I, I wrote a, a piece for the Chicago Reporter. I covered the mayor's campaign while I was at the Chicago Reporter as their political reporter. And I wrote a piece called Race of the Race. And I thought very early on that race was obviously a factor, even though the, the white power establishment, the, the, the supporters of Byrne and Daly sort of ignored Harold Washington, race really mattered. Would you agree with that, Jackie? And, and Oh, ab absolutely. And mm -hmm. we recognize that race was going to be a factor in the campaign before we ever got started. Uh, and so we had um, one of our supporters in Hyde Park do an analysis of the voting pattern of all the people in the, in the, in, in, in Chicago and the way they voted in mayoral, in mayoral elections, mayoral elections. And we, uh, as a result, built our campaign targeting where we thought we could get votes. And those precincts were the only thing we could do was protect, protect the vote on election day. Um, so, and so that was the way we approached the campaign, not in terms of a negative campaign against either of the other two candidates, but how can we maximize the vote for Harold Washington in a very racially divided city? So that's how we started. And of course, we got what we expected from uh, the other side. We got the nasty stuff. And probably the thing that was most outrageous was the vice president came to support the, uh, the uh, Harold um, at, uh, and they went to a church on the north side. Um, and the folks up there were so ugly that they were throwing things, uh, they were saying nasty things to the president as well as to, to Congressman Washington. Uh, and it was really an embarrassment for the city. Uh, but I think all you think it did in terms of our base supporters is to galvanize uh, the vote that we were working on in our base to get out and vote for Harold Washington. But I can so, go on. There are a lot of Nancy stuff that happened in the so, campaign. So what was what was what was, it, what was the breakdown, the racial breakdown um, in the in the primary in the general, Jackie, uh, in terms of the percentages, uh, demographic percentages? And did he did he did he do any better in the general uh, in terms of bringing in a more diverse uh, a set of voters than in the primary? Yeah, ab absolutely. The city was I don't know I have I don't remember the exact number, but roughly a third, a third, a third, a third black. A third uh, uh, Latino and a and a third white, uh, and so our base actually we built on the on the one third that's black, as well as building on the the part of the one third that was uh, Latino, and then uh, getting the the lakefront as we call them lakefront liberals uh, up and down the lakefront, so that we had a coalition of black, brown, and and white uh, supporters that came out on election day. Now, at the, in the general election, yes, we did get the support of some of those folks. Uh, and and, and Louis, uh, Louis can probably comment on this. But one of the things I learned during the campaign that um, the Mexican-Americans kind of, like in Mexico, the, the tendency was to support the incumbent, right? So Jane Byrne was the mayor, and she started off with that uh, Mexican-American support. But uh, in the general election, we were able to build on the support we did have. It's not that we didn't get any support out of the Mexican-American community, but we were able to increase that vote as well as uh, the white vote along the lakefront. And I think we even got some, uh, some of the kind of outlying uh, wards, some, some votes, not a lot, but some votes. If you look at the, the final vote tally, there were votes uh, in, in most of the precincts in Chicago. Luis, do you want to pick up on that? Where, where did the Latino vote come from and how and why did sure. that happen at that time? Well, let me just say this. First of all, to Jackie, thank you for that little mention of love. I know she doesn't, she probably didn't realize it, but she said Louie. And if you remember, it was Chewy and Louie, Louie and Chewy. <laughs> and so when you go back to that time, no, Jackie's representative of a time, right, in my life, right? where everybody calls me Louie. I just went to the Harold Washington um, celebration at the Harold Washington Library. I never got called Louie as much. The last time I got called Louie that much, I was 15 years old, okay? But it's a, it's a, to me, it's a word of love, right? It's a word of remembrance of a certain time in terms of how people, and let me just, so I remember that during the primary, I was a poll watcher. I went and defended a whole 11 votes that Harold Washington got in the precinct, spent all day there. And then Dan Rostenkowski's precinct captain knocked on my door and said, 
Mr. Gutierrez, would you and your lovely wife please put up a sign? And it said, Epton, before it's too late. Now, two things happened, Laura. Number one, I was very, very angry that somebody would think I would put such a racist poster in my window, number one. But second, I felt ashamed that all I had done was be a poll watcher. So I raced down to Fullerton and Western, and you know who I met? I met the Reverend Slip Coleman. He was running the operation there, and he gave me a poll sheet, right? And, and just wow. so for, for those, who, those who don't remember Slim, Slim was, he, he was an activist from uptown. He, yes. Again, another one of those people that was there from the very beginning, yeah. From the very beginning. Uh -huh. And I think what, what he represented was, so what did I do? What life did I live? I lived, I lived in, I, you know, I worked nine to five, five days a week. On weekends, I drank my old style and paid my dominoes and, um, you know, went to baptism, quinceañeras, right? Weddings, had a good life, had a child, owned a home. But after that day, they came with that poster, Laura, it changed my life because I took that post sheet and yes, what did I do? And I'm proud of this. I went through the post sheet and I went and canvassed my whole neighborhood. You know, Laura, I met black people who were my neighbors that I didn't know before. I met Latinos and Puerto Ricans that were my neighbors that lived in my neighborhood that I didn't know, but I also spoke to white voters. And we came together. Remember that precinct where Harold got 11 votes? It was 380 to 320 in the general election. And Jackie's right. Let me just say this. About 20% of the vote that Harold got in the primary was Latino, right? 20% of the Latinos. That means 80% of them either voted for Rich Daly or voted for Jane Byrne. In the general election, it was 60-40. Really? That's an, mm. That was, no, that yes, because he actually, you could see the mess up. And look, I also want to say before we move, because so many people have, I want to say, I'm not the only one that was a potato couch, right? Sitting kind of cynical, why should I get involved? Lynn, you and Laura know thousands, if not tens of thousands of Chicagoans made up an army, Harold Washington's heart. He inspired us all and he changed and transformed all of our lives. And I think he changed the map, the political, I know he changed the map, the political map of the city of Chicago. That's that's a great, really important point. And, and, and I want to go to Gary, to Gary, to you and Peter. Um, what we, what's, what's, is there a great story that, or a significant story that stands out in your mind that, that's, uh, that tells us something very important about the campaigns or even about the Washington administration? Gary? You know, it's interesting. I, I was starting off as a writer, which meant that I was making most of my money as a bartender um, at that, at that <laughs> point. And, you know, I, 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 I'm from New York, that's where I am now, but, you know, I went to college in, in Chicago and I, I stayed, I just was fascinated by Chicago politics. And I would do these rent a party um, gigs, like show up at someone's house and be the bartender. And I remember doing several of them during the campaign. I was starting to write for the reader, um, but just a few articles. And it was during the campaign and, you know, these nice white liberal people, um, I thought they were really pleasant and stuff. And, you know, but I'm just, in the room, right? I'm just standing there and they're friends and they're drunk and they're 20 or 30. I remember this one in the uh, uh, Lincoln Park. And, you know, they start just talking about the N word running for mayor. It's just like, mm. why? Where? Huh? It, and, you know, and the lakefront was such a disappointment. I mean, Jackie, I know what you're saying. You're accentuating the positive that you got 5%, one out of 20 of, you know, white ethnic Northwest, Southwest side of Chicago. Um, it's been zero. Um, but you know, White Lakefront, I, I wish I had the numbers in front of me. I don't think he ever got a majority in 43, 44. I'm not gonna swear by that, but he did shockingly poorly, even in 87, even after you saw this guy's a reformer, he's trying to open up government. You know, this is before and after in Chicago with, with Harold Washington that you know, he's the first anti-machine. I mean, he's the first black mayor, a pioneer that's indelible, but he was so much more than that. I don't think the media ever gave him credit. Uh, for that, but after seeing all the ways he cut, you know, a black man comes in with, you know, uh, unemployment in the black community and he cut the city payroll by thousands of people. He was just trying to reform this broken, you know, flabby machine. And yet he barely got any more votes in 1987 uh, than he did in 1980. 
for me. So I, I don't know why I'm starting with my disappointment in, mm -hmm. I, I guess I was, <laughs> Louis, uh, excuse me, Luis. Um, I never knew that, by the way. It's I okay. To... <laughs> <laughs> I really did. <laughs> Louis and Chewy. Sorry, Mr. Congressman. Sure. Yeah. Any, any, anyway, I, I always thought that was, it just under, it, it taught me something I never unlearned as, uh, as 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 an observer, as a, a, a journalist, I mean, it's interesting. In 2020, 21, 22, we were starting to talk, started to talk about white privilege and all this stuff. But back then, it was just it was it was ugly. I, I lived on the northwest side in Richard Mel's ward. I got the nastiest racial, you know, vine to replace the elevators in city hall with vines. Um, like what? Hmm. You know, so cynical. Crime is going to go up because it's a black mayor. Actually, murder went down. Um, during the Washington years, but you know, just we say it today. But anyway, I, I, I'll, I'll stop. But it's there's so many things we see today, unfortunately, that we all experienced in the 1980s. Yeah, the, the racism is alive and well. And and, and I, I what I would just say is that you know Harold Washington talked about race and racial equity before the term was even even coined, much less fashionable as it is now. And he was being very outspoken and open about fairness. And I think that probably scared a lot of white people because for the same reason it scares them now. But I want I want to move to Peter to you and is it and, and get your recollections. But is it what do you think about what Gary said about the, the maybe the media didn't give Harold Washington enough credit or the credit that was due to him as a member of the media at that time? <laughs> well, let me say that I was um, a reporter who covered the campaign. Now I didn't cover uh, Jackie. Might remember this. I was assigned to uh, to two losers. Uh, I, I was assigned to Richard M. Daly in the primary, and I was assigned to Bernie Epton in the general election. Now we did, I, I think uh, Carol Marine covered Jane Byrne mostly, and uh, the late Paul Hogan spent, I think Jackie might remember that, he, he was with the, uh, uh, the Herald's campaign. I did, but, you know, when somebody wasn't there, we spilled over to the other campaigns. And I remember being at uh, the University of Illinois Pavilion that night when uh, Harold spoke. I think there were 20,000 people there, and uh, it, it was just tremendous. Um, when you, you say, did he get uh, enough credit uh, in the campaign um, by the media? I, I thought he got fair coverage. Um, the, the, of course, the, the campaign, as everybody knows, was it was all all about. There's race was the biggest thing. It was, um, and I remember going into a Bernie Epton uh, uh, rally up on the north side. I don't think it was the congressman's uh, ward, but uh, everybody, <laughs> an all white audience, yelling. Bernie, 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 and, and I'm thinking I'm standing there with my he's, crew, and, and he's a Republican. <laughs> and, and, and I, and I'm, I'm there with my crew, and I and I'm thinking, are, are they? I mentioned this in the book. Are they really uh, yelling, "White guy, white guy, white guy"? Um, but Harold was, uh, you know, was really a, 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 an original. Uh, he was. Uh, he had such a powerful voice and personality and a, a, a fabulous smile. Um, he overcame those, those two things that would hurt any politician early on in his career that he had uh, failed to, uh, he lost his law license for a while because he didn't uh, file, didn't a file his taxes. for a cleaning lady mm -hmm. who, who paid him 50 bucks. And but he was also had uh, then he had the the um, income tax thing. He Harold everybody that knows him had said he had a stubborn streak too when he was younger. Um, he could have settled both those things easily, uh, and and he chose not to do it. But he overcame that stuff and he became. Uh, uh, really a quite a, I knew him mostly in the legislature and he I interviewed him many times down there and um, he was not a uh, he, he was not one of his uh, white uh, 
buddies at um, Roosevelt University said, here was a guy, a bright guy who was held back by race all of his years and, and he never was bitter about it. He just thought people needed to learn more about it. Mm -hmm. Those so, are my thoughts about Harold. Mm -hmm. So Peter, <laughs> Peter, do you remember Sui Generis? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Oh, <laughs> Sui Generis? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sui, oh, I, I know the term. But that, okay, so Jackie, so people know what the heck you're talking about. What that's the heck? Well, Harold, Harold would say all the time what uh, Peter said in English. Uh, that's Latin for uh, one of a kind or, uh, or no. Yes. I, yeah, I, I, it, there, there's a more elegant way of putting it, but essentially that's what it meant. Uh, Sorry, Janeiro. Uh, he, he said it all the time. So okay. Jackie, that, was, Jackie, that was his vocabulary, but go ahead, Lynn. Yeah. So Jackie may or may not remember everyone, all my late night phone calls to her during the campaign uh, when we were talking about everything from where she was picking yard signs uh, up or I guess down to more strategic things. But I wanted to share a very vivid memory of when I, as a young and aspiring political reporter, realized something was going on. One of the things that was really big back in the day were wearing buttons. And the, uh, and the Washington campaign had these big blue buttons with it looked like a, a kind of a rainbow. There were lines on it. And it came to pass that Daly and Byrne would have buttons too. And people w wore them as badges to tell where everybody was. But I saw more Washington badges. But when I was out on the street, I would uh, go through neighborhoods in the city, and yes, especially in the South and West Side, because it was crucial to turn out uh, the Black vote. And there would be a sound truck saying, Harold's here. And people would just come on the streets. Uh, and there would be people, an outpouring of people, uh, to just see something that I don't know if you could replicate it uh, in this way with just a sound truck coming and people running out to see what's going on. But that was one very uh, unscientific way of understanding that something was going on uh, out in the precincts. The other thing I want to point out is that the primary and the general was the first time that all the candidates used TV ads. And this was important because it was another way of communicating with voters. Harold Washington got a little late because he didn't have the money. And by the time of the, uh, he, so he had a set of commercials for the general, excuse me, for the primary and then for the general. And we talked about a few moments ago, this incident, this ugly incident at St. Paschal Church when uh, Vice President Mondale and Harold Washington were jeered and booed. Well, the campaign in a very, very quick turnaround created a commercial called Shame and it had one of the uh, iconic bits of video of, of, uh, of an angry young white man uh, jeering uh, Mondale and Washington. And it had this very interesting, very effective, I thought, um, line in it from the voiceover. What's happening, when you vote on Tuesday, be sure it's a vote you could be proud of. So as, as well as the street stuff and the street organizing, you, you had a lot of things going on for Chicagoans in the, for a first time in setting this campaign uh, and setting uh, the history of uh, the campaigns in the city that Washington would have even in his reelection. Yeah, and I remember covering the, the, the debates. Uh, I think there were, were there a couple of debates, Jackie, is that right? <laughs> but between the three, between the three candidates. Three, there, three debates, yeah. Three debates. And that is where, and talk about imagery, that wasn't about a campaign commercial. That was about a public news event that really, I think, in many ways, changed the dynamic of the campaign because it gave Harold Washington a, a stage, an equal stage. Yes. The media hadn't really given him equal credit as a candidate, but he was there on stage with Vernon Daly and he showed him up, in my opinion. And it was a really, really great. Decision. So ja Jackie, do you, what do you recall? What was the significant thing that yeah, came out I, of those uh, debates? Uh, Laura, uh, you're absolutely right. It did uh, kind of change the campaign. 
because one of the things that we were fighting in the black community was the thought that a black man can't win in Chicago. You know, uh, that it was an impossible, you know, Don, Don Quixote type uh, uh, enterprise. And so when Harold was on the stage with those other two candidates, uh, and he was the third candidate to answer the first question. And he started by saying, I am going to be the first one on the stage to answer your question and proceeded <laughs> to answer the question. But more than that, you know, he described himself on the stage that he was the best candidate for mayor of the city of Chicago and went on to demonstrate it throughout that debate and in and the other two, two debates. So I, I think his performance not only spoke to the media that we better pay attention to this guy, but it got to the audience that I was interested in and that was our base vote, overcoming the fear that it was impossible, you know, a pass to, to, for a black man to be elected mayor of Chicago. Louis, Louis, you were, you were, you're not, yes. you're here. Is there anything you, you want yes. to, to add to that? Yeah, it's, um, the debates, without them, I don't think Harold wins. The debates were critical. You put them on the stage and it was clearly who was the most eloquent. Yeah. And I don't want to diminish the intelligence of Jane Byrne or, or Richie Daly, but if you looked at them, you said, who's got the IQ here? Uh, who's got the language, right? Who is really speaking so elegantly, so eloquently, so forcefully, and at the same time, so intelligently? It was clearly Harold Washington, and that broke a stereotype, right? It broke the stereotype, um, and it helped me and others um, to be able to go out there and campaign. One of the things, it was so bad at Roberto Clemente High School that one, Richard Daly ran in 1989 for mayor, and there was a debate at Roberto Clemente High School. Richie Daly told me, I'm not going back there. I still remember getting booed. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and it was a terrible, he, he remembers, I had a terrible experience <laughs> back there. Of course, of course, um, to Lynn and to, to Laura, you know what I responded to uh, then State's Attorney Daly. I said, yeah, I was doing the booing. Uh, so you don't have to quite worry about at least one less voice out there booing you at Clemente. Anyways, I think they were critical to the city. And I do want to say that in, by 1987, not only did Harold carry the 26th ward by a majority, okay? Not only did he carry the 22nd ward by a majority in the primary, by the general election, he defeated Nesda, Joe Barrios, and the Keen Machine in the 31st ward carried the 34th Ward, and he defeated Miguel Santiago, the current alderman who was part of the Verdoli Act 29. So I get it that there was still a lot to do. And I know I'm speaking through my, my, my small prism, right, of the kid from Humble Park. But in Humble Park, we were unifying people. We were bringing people together. And if you look at my reelection effort, right, we did bring a broad coalition of people together. Could we have done better as Gary Rivlin suggests to us? Absolutely. Would Harold have done better? Because I believe that at the moment of his death, mm -hmm. he was at the pinnacle of his power mm -hmm. and influence because he had defeated everybody, right? He was, you remember that he went to Pachinsky and said, you can run for, for clerk. Oh, oh, yeah, remember oh, yeah, all yeah, that? the dream ticket that he put right. together just before, and they all won. Mm -hmm. So all I'm trying to say is that as soon as he wins re-election, the next time around, what does he do? He goes to somebody like Aurelia Pachinsky. He goes um, to Carol Mosley Broad, remember? Uh, she gets to run mm -hmm. uh, at the county level. Oh, and he went on to become the, US together this beautiful coalition of people. Unfortunately, he wasn't there to see his success, right? Um, but at the same time, it was a beautiful success story. Mm. I want to move um, to, there's so, there's so much history to cover. We're not going to get to it now, but I'll, we have to talk about council wars because of course, as you, Louis Gutierrez was one of the people that broke the dam on council wars, uh, <laughs> uh, the 29-21. And it, we, we, we solicit questions from folks in advance from our audience. So I just want to kick us off with this question from Suzanne S. And she says, Harold Washington remains seemingly unflappable in this in the face of all the dirty tricks aldermen. How did he cope? And do you miss him as much as I do? 
whether we miss him or not, Gary, uh, how did what, what was your vantage point from covering that in terms of him, him managing the the, the Vidoliak Burke 2029? 20, I mean, I was on the outside. Uh, if you on this call were on the inside. You know, I did do some reporting for the book after the after the fact, but I don't know. I, I, Harold Washington had lots had lots of gifts. Amazing coalition builder. We talked about his intellect, his vocabulary. He's a, a kid who was reading books every day and inhaled words. Amazing, but he's kind of got angry. I thought, you know, early on, and I thought you could see it. I mean, one thing that's amazing about Washington, for at least for Peter and I, is people writing about. Him from the outside is he's fascinating he, he's you know he, he's kind of this regular guy just in the sense that someone i think lynn you said earlier he didn't pay his taxes he paid his taxes he just didn't file the form file the returns. Returns. sorry yes thank he's you probably owed, he's probably owed money he had a chip on his shoulder as someone else mentioned like he would screw up and not pay his bills i think it's, he was such so monomaniacal he was just so focused on Whatever it was, just this is a man who was talking about police brutality starting in the 70s. Like mm -hmm. now, 50 years later, now we're talking about it. You know, maybe in, since 2015 or so, it's become a part of national thought. Back in the early 70s, that's what he broke with the Chicago machine. Um, what was his friend, uh, Ralph Metcalf's best friend? Yeah, his congressman, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and so, yeah. I mean, that's what made him break with the machine. I, I, I don't know. He, he, He's sort of an extraordinary figure, but you know, very, very human, and I think kind of being angry with him was part of that. Mm. Peter, Peter, you cover council wars. Uh, you know, I I'm trying to think. I mm. left broadcasting at around 1987. It, it actually, I did was... cover some of council wars. Um, one of the things I remember. Uh, when Harold, you know, he could, uh, he had a short fuse, as they said, as a, a young guy too. Um, and he was a boxer and on the council floor, uh, Verdoliak, uh, was saying something and uh, that he didn't like. And Harold said, you better be careful, Mr. Verdoliak, or you're going to get a mouthful of something. <laughs> and then right. another time that was kind of a light moment, uh, Verdoliak got up and said that he wanted to thank the mayor for he got a he bet on a horse at Arlington or somewhere called Sweet Harold and it had a good payoff of a couple hundred bucks and Harold said well you know uh, maybe uh, you ought to think about sharing some of the proceeds to that and then Verdoliak comes back and says hey I've been trying to do that for three years and uh it's going one way, <laughs> but, you know, um, Harold, uh, uh, Mike Royko wrote a great column uh, right after the election. he said, don't worry, Uncle Chester, uh, Mayor Washington is not going to marry your daughter. Uh, and, and it was his way of saying uh, nothing's, you know, there's not a big disaster that this guy is the mayor. And it certainly wasn't. There was no person better prepared to be mayor since Mayor Richard J. Daley. Harold had been in politics all his life, government. He knew how everything worked. Uh, and when he was in office, he, uh, you know, the garbage got picked up. Uh, the police headquarters was not moved to the south side as some people had feared. Uh, and he ran a good show. He, he opened up government. You know, a lot of the papers couldn't uh, get into a lot of city departments and get records. They'd have to file freedom of information requests. Harold opened that all that stuff up to have transparency. Yes. So uh, he had uh, he had a lot more. To, uh, the congressman is is absolutely right that. That debate was uh, unbelievable for Harold. He was just uh, terrific. Mm. He, he, mm. he was he, he was way, way above the rest. Of, uh, he he, <laughs> he outclassed everybody on that stage. Right. Yeah. So yeah, to absolutely. the point of, of it, and Jackie may remember this. The Sun Times did, and I was one of the reporters. Because so much data was available, we did a whole series that became a book. 
and we had uh, who works for the city. You know, you we we could go on and on. Uh, and there's a picture of a very young Lynn Sweet and very younger um, uh, Jaffe Grimshaw on this. But the point is statistics that were not available that could be compiled did come before uh, that were never really able to be easily put together. Uh, we didn't need years of FOIA Freedom of Information Act uh, requests to put it together mm -hmm. uh, to set the stage for Harold's reelection for the second term that he, as we've been talking about, uh, he died a few months after he was elected. And so we only have a few minutes left. So I want to do, this has been so great. We, we should have done another, we should do another hour on this, you know? Please. It only comes around once every hundred years. I have to think about it. Yeah. Again, and this is great. But I want to, I want to close out by asking each of you, um, Rufus W., another one of our loyal watchers asks, what is the greatest lesson from the election and administration of Mayor Washington? The greatest lesson. Uh, Jackie? Yes. <clears throat> you know, Lynn, I think, started to touch on it, and that was a uh, hero really brought the people into government. You know, Harold would say that this, this government belongs to the people, and he opened up government so that people could participate, so that, you know, researchers and reporters could, could see what was happening, right? Uh, that uh, people, uh, Harold made us go out to the community before budget time and listen to people's needs and concerns in the community. And then that ended up being the basis for us building a, a, a budget. Uh, and, and so, you know, the openness, you know, the freedom, uh, the transparency, you know, getting rid of the, 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 the patronage that governed who could participate in, in terms of employment and contracting with the city of Chicago. So, you know, I think, you know, if there's a legacy for Hero, is that government should be of thy and for the people. And he, he did that in Chicago. And to yeah. that, let me just read a story that was headlined, mm -hmm. Mayor Staff Outsiders Are In. Uh, the outsiders are in. A startling number of them are women. Chicago never before has seen anything like Mayor Washington staff and cabinet. Quote, my God, how things have changed, said Jacqueline Grimshaw, a top mayoral staffer who had spent years fighting City Hall. Yep. That's absolutely. Those reforms and those changes are part of, are, are just heart and soul of government now. And you can never go back. And I don't think any politician in City Hall would ever want to even try to go back. Uh, yes. Luis Gutierrez, uh, what's the greatest lesson? Yeah. The greatest lesson is that he represented everybody with courage. Two things. I know that I speak I can say this, I know women feel this way, black people feel this way, the LGBTQ community feels this way, that they were finally not invisible, okay? I'm just gonna give it to you from a Latino perspective, right? While we were invisible at City Hall, nobody ever saw us. And yet Deputy Mayor for Infrastructure under Harold Washington, that's a top cabinet position, Deputy Mayor. Maria Sel, the Mayor's Office of Employment and Training. Um, Laura, before that, you and I both know the Puerto Rican was always the assistant to the assistant to somebody's assistant. But under Harold Washington, wow, he gave us the realms of power, infrastructure and jobs, mm -hmm. and, and two Puerto Ricans are in charge. Wow. <laughs> he, 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 and no, I, I have to say it that way just mm -hmm. to kind of break through the ice, right? And secondly, I still remember the gay rights ordinance. And look, I'm Catholic. I'm Catholic. I was born Catholic. That's where I'm baptized. That's how I'm going to be died. I expect to have my last rites. And we bring up the gay rights ordinance, right? And the cardinal, who the year before had said, yeah, you know, we shouldn't discriminate on sexual orientation, comes out like a couple of days before and says, no, we're all going to vote. No, we still voted for it. Mm -hmm. Why? Because Harold Washington did something unique that many of us forget. He put at the same level LGBTQ rights with civil rights. Remember, Jackie, what he said? He said, gay rights are civil rights. Wow, for a man to put those two things at the same level, they are at the same level. They deserve to be at the same level. We're talking 1986. Let's remember, it took our, uh, our President Barack Obama almost to the last year of his presidency before he came out for gay marriage. Uh, so this was a man who, in spite of the fact that there were black ministers, the cardinal, 
rabbis saying no. He stood on his principle because if anything Harold was, was a civil rights advocate. It's another example of how far ahead of, he, of his time he was on so many issues. He was, a, thank you, Laura. He was far ahead of his time. Gary Riblin, your, your, your greatest lesson. It's like you're reading my mind, Louis, because that's exactly what I was going to talk about. <laughs> by, by, by coincidence, I was writing a profile, Ron Sable, Dr. Ron Sable, who's trying to be the first yes. alderman. And so I went to the first, I was, I was also friends with a, 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 a deputy, or actually uh, Kit Duffy, she was the LBGT, I don't know if that's the term they used back then, liaison. I think she was a gay, gay and lesbian li liaison, <laughs> is that the right term, Jackie? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and I remember going there and like, I was impressed. I'm a liberal minded fellow, uh, but like, why is he doing this? He's got so many battles going on, you know, the council wars, they're playing races. There's so many things going on is, you know, uh, Louise, you mentioned, they just got the black preachers. I mean, also kind of the, I call them the black machinists, the machine <laughs> aldermen who were from the, uh, the black communities who kind of wish Harold Washington was a different kind of mayor because, hey, we want our spoils now. So he's taking on all these different things and he's like, at, he's, he's spending political capital and two things. One, he's just one principled guy. I mean, you know, this is what he believes and no one's going to tell him he can't go because it's going to hurt him uh, politically. If you, you tell him that, he might go because of that. But the other thing is that he was an extraordinary coalition builder. I mean, this, you know, kind of this idea of a rainbow coalition, that wasn't his term, but this multiracial progressive coalition uh, built around shared priorities, kind of progressive totems like affordable housing, let's rebalance so downtown doesn't get everything in the neighborhoods share, a different approach to economic uh, development. And he brought all these people together. It worked in the Latino community. You know, Luis, you are correct. He, he got a majority, a big majority, by you know, the, the general election in 1987. It did not work as well um, with the Northwest, Southwest, and as I've been arguing, the liberal lakefront. But you know, in a weird way, when he passed away, it kind of had worked. You mm -hmm. know, people are like, why did we hate him? Why did not we not give credit? I, I actually feel if Harold Washington had run for re-election with the mindset everyone had after he died, where finally he was getting his due, the media could break through whatever wasn't allowing them to give him his due, suddenly he was beloved by a lot more than that original coalition. I, I think begrudgingly much of Chicago, not all of Chicago, there's some stone cold racist, right. but you know, uh, you know, he was begrudgingly embraced by a lot of unlikely suspects in the Northwest, Southwest uh, right. side. He was, he was amazing. He, he let everyone see themselves in his image. Mm -hmm. You know, he was for this, he was for that. But like, I'm a reformer. I'm the first anti-machine candidate in several, at least a couple of generations. And that's what, you know, kind of more progressive minded white lake front anti-machine people saw. The Latino community is like, hey, we're dealing with the same bias and stuff. The gay community yes. offers their, offers their, 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 their <laughs> hand in support and he accepts it and, you know, stands there next to um, uh, now his gay cam comrades. It, it, it as other people have said, he, he was just extraordinary. In that right. Way. Well, I, I remember, I remember it is, you know, after he died and it was lying in state at City Hall and the lines around the blocks in the freezing cold in late November and a very multiracial, uh, multi-ethnic group. There were a lot of, a lot of people, that, a lot more people loved him at the end than in, at the beginning. And that's, yes. that's worth saying. <laughs> so Peter Nolan, you get the final word, the greatest lesson or, or final thought on Harold Washington. Well, uh, along the lines of what you're talking about, uh, about how he brought people together. I have a picture that I'm very proud of in my home of my wife and me and Harold at a dinner dance, you know where it is? It's out on the southwest side at Bill Lipinski's uh, ward, the 23rd Ward, which probably did not vote too heavily, but Lipinski was for <laughs> Harold. And, uh, and he shows up at this, um, this dinner dance, and he, I remember him doing the polka with Polish women. <laughs> so <laughs> my thing about him was he kind of, represented what, what Dr. King always said uh, was you can't fight uh, hate with more hate 
you have to fight it with love. And I think that's the lesson wow. that I like. Yeah, yeah. Nice final word. And, and well said. Laura, I just before before we end this mm -hmm. this wonderful discussion, though, I do have one thing that has stuck with me. I I was uh, a beginning uh, political reporter when I covered the campaign, and and I had a very I was big part in in some of the council wars coverage. Was a big player in covering Luis's twenty sixth ward automatic run that helped give uh, Washington power, but in uh, in the run-up to the re-election, there was, uh, Harold Washington was leaving it open as to how he would run. Would he say he's a Democrat or not? Because uh, Tom Hines went and was going to form his own party. People wanted to avoid a loss. People wanted two bites at the apple. And this is what set the stage for changing uh, the rules over how we elect mayors. It is in that, you know, this is all this partisan election we have that we're going into next year in Chicago was a, an attempt to stop Harold to always give a one-on-one -on -one and not just have a, in a democratic city, have him win. So I'm asking him, are you gonna run this Democrat? Are you gonna form a party? What are you gonna do? And I had the wink and the nod. I knew him. he was always a Democrat, but he said, well, <clears throat> I can't tell you. I said, why can't you tell me? Because in politics, said Harold Washington, you always have to leave them guessing. And that's a lesson that I have found is true to this day in every arena of government and politics that I've covered. Uh, and Laura, I know we've spent a lot of time together. Uh, it's a historic show for At The Table. And as we finish up here, I wanna thank all our guests for joining us as we mark the 100th anniversary of the birth of Harold Washington. Thank you so much.